Hi, my name's Isaac Lomley and I'm part of the team here at Aquatech. Today I have the privilege of being able to speak with a very special guest and an incredibly talented photographer, Andrew Seymour. Andrew spent many years devoted to chasing some of the biggest swells that hit the rugged coastlines around his home, all the while capturing that raw beauty and power through the lens of his camera. Andrew has also spent the last two years working as a stills photographer for the feature length film Facing Monsters and this follows the life of slab wave surfer Kirby Brown. Today I'll be chatting with Ange about life as a photographer on the Southwest, as well as the experience on set for the Facing Monsters film and also the process created in creating his new book Facing Monsters which is based on the film. So I'm super excited to chat with Ange today, so let's get into it. Welcome, mate. Good to see you. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, mate. Good to see you. Total privilege to have you here, and I'm really looking forward to chatting about um you know about life in the southwest and what you've been up to over the past couple of years. So, no, it's awesome. I really appreciate coming on and having a chat about everything that's been going on. So, you grew up in the southwest, did you? Like you you started out around there. You lived your life in that area yeah so where i'm living now is where i grew up um i spent all my years down here which has been really really good it's, it's such, like so blessed to live in such a an amazing part of the world it's so diverse because you've got like the red dirt desert up north that you know this desert that meets the ocean and then all the way to where we are here in the southwest where it's these beautiful carry forests and all beautiful beaches it's really really untouched and then you further south again it's this real rugged untouched coastline that is it's so beautiful and so perfect to be a photographer in it's it's unlimited what you can create i, I saw something um that you flogged one of your parents um film cameras back in the day and that's kind of what started your know, kind of passion with photography is that where you began yeah so i start um i love shooting landscapes that's where it all kind of started off and we did a trip to new zealand when i was about 15 i think it was 14 15 and i had my parents old film camera that i've still got with me now and that's where it all began i remember just going around new zealand as a grom taking photos of these crazy landscapes and then it merged from there, always having a, you know, a camera with me afterwards. And eventually it evolved because no, no one really surfed in my family, but then I loved being in the ocean, loved surfing, um, got involved with that. And then it was an evolution of process of, I really enjoyed taking photos as well, but um, it got to a point where it finally kind of crossed paths with the love of the ocean, the surfing and things like that. And then merging in your love for photography and uh, buying a camera and buying a housing from you guys at the very beginning there and just starting off that way so yeah that's where it all began here in the in the sleepy little town of Vass. Vass. So I guess that time well spent in the ocean as a young guy has kind of laid some foundations for you for now for what you what you're able to do out there you know yeah. it's not like you, you don't just pick up a jet ski and, and drive out into the middle of the ocean and start shooting these amazing waves. That's something that you've obviously developed over quite a long period of time. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's where it all started with my dad because he, you chuck in a boat and you just steam out into the middle of the ocean and you go fishing. And so I think being uh, kind of raised in that environment and he would oftentimes probably push the limits a little bit too much as well. But um, so it kind of wore off on me, I guess. And then uh, me and my brother used to just love surfing, love everything to do with the ocean. And so we just, I think because we're consi we were consistently around probably bigger, heavier um, oceans, it, it's just like a, a, I suppose you kind of get a little bit comfortable. Um, 
but then it, it, it's still you can push it like more and more and more when you head to the south coast and it's yeah it's a whole new level down there so yeah and so at what point did things start to become a bit more serious for you with your photography you know what 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 kind of drove you to start to chase it a little bit harder than just something for fun there was a trip i did it was because I had spent a lot of time on that south coast because you had family living down there. So we did spend a bit of time not really realising what was out there. Um, and then I suppose, well, I did a few trips and there was this one trip in particular. I had shot a certain wave on that south coast. And I just remember feeling so little because the ocean was, it's like, put me in my place and you realize that how insignificant you are in amongst these like larger pieces of ocean. I just fell in love with it. I remember just, there was one particular wave that it broke and it was so big and round. You're just like, wow, that was just the most incredible piece of ocean I've ever seen. And from that point, I think I, it was like an addiction. Like you just like, wow, this is, this is where I want to be because it was a place where you, I was well out of my depth, not used to it, and I just wanted more of it. So that's when I think it kind of all started to kick off where I, I used to go down on the south coast and chase these huge southern ocean swells, and I just fell in love with it from there, and, and that's where it kind of evolved to where it is now. In the, in the kind of early days of you know, getting down there and trying to capture these moments like there's there's quite a bit that has to go into something like this well were there's you know any kind of hard lessons that you learned pretty early on that you're like well i won't do that again or anything that kind of steered the path for you away from just getting out there and you know chasing the most crazy ways did you you know think all right this is a bit more serious and we have to dial this in you know a bit more carefully I suppose there's heaps, like um, heaps I've learnt safety-wise. I have done some, like done some training now in both heavy water training and some um, apnea training as well. And then, like especially looking after my gear and and treating that, you know, well, so it, it serves you well out there because it's so remote. So you really have to be prepared for everything and so that's been an evolution like i probably at the start i was super lazy but um yeah it's definitely got a lot better now so what kind of planning goes into one of your missions you know out out and down the coast in those big ways there's obviously like you're going there to take photos but there's just so much more that goes into it you know from you know the weather forecasting and preparing the photo equipment but then, you know, the ski, it's quite a long drive. So, yeah, give us a bit of an insight into how much preparation there is into what, what, what really goes on to getting, on, getting down and getting out on, amongst these waves. So you kind of got to cater for everything. So whether if it's a nice clear day and it's going to be good to swim, so you've got the ability to jump in with your housing all loaded, ready to go. Um, is sometimes it feels a little bit sketchy in the water, I won't swim. It's, it just depends on conditions because it's sometimes it can be a little eerie and then other times it's a, a bit more pleasant. Um, and then, yeah, we set off. I, I mean, I set off from here. So it's a, it depends on how far I want to go. There's a couple of spots like three hours from where I am and then there's other spots where it's a 10, 12 hour drive um, and you're going super remote just to shoot empty oceans. And so preparing like you just load everything up you've got you have all your food and everything prepped water everything ready to go and then you set off from there um, a lot of the times it's you sleep in a swag or if you're a little bit closer to uh, um, civilization you can get a bed at a hostel or something like that but um, a lot of the times it's you're swagging out you're taking all your own gear all your own food all, all your own water and then you probably can be off the radar for maybe two to three days or even longer, so four to five. So in terms of the photography equipment that you're, you're taking along, so you spend most of your time um, either shooting from a jet ski or either shooting in the water. Do you have different setups depending on what, what your, your goals are for the, the trip or the session? Um, and, and does that affect the equipment that you're going to bring along? 
Yeah, it all varies. So I love shooting with the A5 mil. That's like one of my favorites. So that's kind of a little bit of my go-to water setup. Um, so that having that kind of ready to go and your, your camera there ready to go. But if the conditions don't really line up, you want to be looking at, hey, maybe I'm sitting back today on the ski shooting on the ski, it's a 70 to 200 or a 135. And so having like lens ports and everything available there ready to go is huge. And oh, and a weather shield as well. I've been using the Aquatech weather shield for like forever. And it's because sometimes you'll, you'll get out there and you just want to fire off a few frames and see how it's feeling. And you can do that and then you're like, all right, I'm prepped, ready to go for a swim now. I can just flip over my case and, and having the ability there just to change the lens, drop it into the camera and then jump in is, is huge. Is it nerve wracking when you're sitting on the ski and you've got these 10, 15 foot waves flying by? You've just got a weather shield. Like I'd be like, I wouldn't be jumping on the ski <laughs> without having my camera in the housing. I'm like, yeah, like one little knock and then, you know, it's all over. So yeah. obviously you, you, you're a bit experienced in it, so you kind of got it down, but yeah, is it kind of nerve wracking sometimes? It can be, it definitely can be. There's like, you got to time it with the conditions well. If it's real windy and it's like, you're getting a lot of uh, like water blowing off the back of waves and it's like water stirred up, cause it's big, there's a lot of water moving. And so you have to be pretty dialed in, but um, yeah, I, I think uh, being a little bit seasoned to it and just like, you know, knowing my limitations, like, well, I know you, you need to button up in your housing today because it's, it's pretty rogue and it's raining and all those things. And so it all depends. Like a lot of the time you get up in the morning and you, you're checking the buoy and seeing what it's doing. You're having a look at the winds and then you set up from there. But having, I just have every possible aspect kind of covered in my Pelican case the best I can. And so it just gives me that ability to, if I'm jumping in, I'm good to go or if I'm sitting back I'm covered and I'm not gonna flood a camera with a you know like or I'm dropping a 70 to 200 in the housing with the lens and and going from there and so I wanted to ask you something that uh, ask you about something that blew my mind when I first heard about it and um you know I know that there's been a, a few of the a few of the top surfers have you know had a go at photographing um doing the double toe so coming in behind the surf, you know, these are the, some of the best big wave slab surfers in the world, picking up a camera and having a go. But as far as I know, and not to discredit your, your surfing ability in any way, but you're the first photographer that I know of that's thought, yeah, I, I'll have a go at that as well. And um, tried to pick up the camera and, and attempt one of the double toe shots out at the right. And um, it didn't go as planned, mate. <laughs> it definitely didn't go as planned, yeah. I, I definitely discredit my surfing ability. It's not the best. I just love it. You know, like I love surfing. And so I'll just give it a, a red on go. And so that particular day, um, yeah. So I've always wanted to do it. Um, and there's guys that, I mean, photographers like that have given a good go and then also surfers that have given a good go. And, and it has gone like majority of the time, it's gone a bit pear shaped, especially down at the right. And so, when I, there was this particular day, me and a surfer, Jake Osman, we've always wanted to give it a go. And so it was conditions, that, it was this beautiful sunny day. It was kind of slowing off. The tide was high and we're like, hey, do we want to give it a shot? I'm like, yeah, why not? And so anyway, we, we did get, we got stuck in pretty much straight away. And I just hadn't, I had no idea, to be honest. It was pretty, pretty, um, yeah, brave of me to give it a you know red hot crack without actually really realizing what I was getting myself into, and so we got a couple of smaller ones, and it didn't really do anything. And I just remember like this lump kind of showed up, and Jake was just screaming to the driver, Henry Davies, is just like go go go, and I thought oh we're on here, and anyway I remember just let go of the rope, and I just come in I was in, on the worst angle and I fell off before I even got into the wave I just like twisted awkwardly fell at the top and I just remembered as I fell I was like oh I'm in a bit of strife here and and sure enough yeah I went top to bottom uh in the lip and that's where it <laughs> I just remember like I was you know like free falling in this wave in the lip just thinking oh this is 
this is not good. I just kind of held onto my housing the best I could and just it obliterated me. I just, it was so violent and I had, a, I had an impact vest and that's when I had been doing my training before then. So I just kind of had to fall back on that training mentally because I was like, all right, you've got to now just focus in and do what you got to do. And I pulled both canisters, so I, I, I blew up. But I remember like my vest was fully inflated and I was holding onto my housing, but I was, I thought I was coming up, but I was actually upside down. And so by the time the wave had stopped, it, it flipped me around and then I slowly popped up and housing was intact, uh, a little bit of blood out of the nose and the ears, but I remember popping up and the, the ski driver that dropped us in, he just looked, he's probably his face kind of set it up. He was like, whoa, oh, you don't look too crash hot. And so he chucked me on the <laughs> ski and I went back to the channel with the, uh, my tail between my legs. So you probably would have been kicking yourself if you didn't have a go, hey? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've had a go after that now. Like, I've probably just, without the camera, I just surfed it. Just, and I'd still really like to give it a go. Um, but I'm going to probably bring the surfing ability up a little bit before <laughs> I attempt that one next time. So so was it was it after Kirby saw your, your mad bottom turning skills that he gave you the call up to come and work on the movie? <laughs> Oh, I, I don't know if I'd get a call off if you saw those skills, but um, <laughs> it was when we first kind of kicked off meeting each other was we had, a, there was a swirl down on the South Coast and um, I spent the day, I was swimming out there and Russell Ord was out. He was, you know, out there crazy with a fish eye on one of the biggest days I've ever seen. And I was kind of just sitting back and where we really kicked off is when I saw Kirby just get one of the most mental ones I've ever seen down there. And I was like, I was swimming around and he kicked out of the back and I was like, wow, that was incredible. And that's kind of where the conversation started. And um, from there over the years, we've just been, we'd chat and we'd hang it, you know, like we'd cross paths, but we'd always stay in contact. And we, we always wanted to do something a little bit different. And so when last year kind of, uh, yeah, it was last year, I think it was when it come about there, the whole pandemic hit and it was a real interesting time of year for everyone and I got the call up that they had they were filming the feature documentary for Facing Monsters uh, obviously here in the Western Australia and so he called us up and he's like oh you know I'd love for you to shoot the steals the guys from production crew are going to give you a call and I was like yeah sweet I was just like I was so into it and so yeah that's when that's when it all come about and and that's where this whole project started. So after you got the, the, the call up to work on the film, did they, did they hire you specifically to, to come and, and shoot surfing or did they you know, give you the full picture of what the film was gonna be about and that you would be shooting you know, action, but a bit of lifestyle and you know, there's, there's a whole range of f photography genres included in, in what you're doing on, on this job. So was that kind of upfront with you or was it something new and a bit of a surprise that you weren't just sitting on the, on the ski, taking photos of Kirby riding these death-defying waves? Was it you know, a bit of a new experience to not be just focused on the surfing action, but to capture you know, the whole scene and the story? It was a huge learning curve in that, that I, it's not just the action, it's the, the whole story that goes with it. And so I was, your confidence probably to shoot the, these waves and these bigger, um, like what I'm accustomed to, is I'm more comfortable in that, but then it was the, the stuff that I probably hadn't been focusing on that really kind of pushed me to the next level to, yeah, to really push it and create more. Some of the, the images in the book and um, you know, from the film, the, the waves are just mind boggling. Like what, what Kirby's doing and, and what he's writing. Like I get sweaty hands just turning, you know, looking, looking at the book. So to be able to, you know, be in your, your shoes or your wetsuit, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the, in the middle of the, you know, the ocean, so far from land and from help, like what's, what's going through your mind as you're watching, you know, Kirby and the, the rest of the guys on, on the crew? I'm still like a little kid out there. I love it. It's like, it's so exciting. And then like some of these waves that he surfs, you're just like, no way that, and then he'll pop out and you're just like, I, in your head, like, because I'm still shooting photos, 
But in my mind, I'm just like so psyched because I was like, that was incredible. Like there's waves that you just didn't think could be, he could ride them that way, well, uh, ride them. And then he just pops out and he just rides them so good. And he does what he does, he's like, he, it's an art form what he does and it's incredible to watch. And I still like, it's so exciting to be a part of. And you do, like you sit there on the ski and you, I just, I know that I'm just grinning ear to ear, like when he takes off and lets go. But I think a lot of the time I'm almost holding my breath. But then when you see him kick out, you're just like, whoa, that was the best thing ever. And yeah, so it's so, so exciting to be a part of and the energy from the ocean and also seeing someone, you know, do what they do and be at that, that such a high level of, of ability is surfing. It's incredible to watch and be a part of. So it's been, it was a huge privilege to be there and, and to capture it. They seem like the kind of guys that would be down there doing it if there was no photographer or cinematographer around anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, Kirby's that guy. And that's what, I, I, what I've really learned to love about the whole project is if I was there or if I wasn't there, he would still let go of the rope. And to be there to shoot the photos and portray what he does from my perspective was incredible. And so, and he does it, you know, he's so humble about it. He just, he, he gets the job done doesn't blow it up at all and 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 so i've really like i really appreciate that i've learned to I, I wanted to adapt to that into my own work and so that i'd feel like i don't have to blow this out i just showcasing what an incredible individual you know is out there doing is it this is the first time you've put together a, a book isn't it yeah this is my yeah my first book and so me and kirby had spoke about this wanting to do something a little bit different. Um, being able to create a full story, I couldn't, I wanted to showcase a story that, you know, like a, a physical, you know, tangible object that you could have and keep forever rather than maybe just a social media post and whatnot. I just couldn't, I just couldn't bring myself just to, you know, chuck a photo on social media like, hey, I did this. It's like, no, you know, like push yourself to the next level and go and create something. And so that was where the book idea come about. We got to work designing it and then quickly found out uh, what is quite the process. And so <laughs> I was well, well over my head, but I had, I had so many incredible people help me along the way, support it, encourage it um, and help build build it into what it is today and yeah I'm so stoked on the outcome and I can't wait to uh, yes. get it out there. How was the experience to step back from you know I'm not saying you would create content for social media but that that was kind of like one of your main channels so to now be able to sit back and focus on a single piece of work that's taken so much time um, and, and putting it into print what was that experience like to be able to you know slow down i guess a little bit it was really refreshing because now stepping out and finishing this after you know a couple of years and only you know limited them now of people know what you're up to and being able to create a volume of work that i'm so proud of that i can showcase to people it, like the whole the, i suppose keeping up on the social media side of things fell away and it, it gave me it was the clarity that I got to focus in on the project was incredible. So I was like fully dialed in, like this is what I want to do. And all my creative effort went into doing this. And so not having the need to feel like I had to post, but then still having that goal that I wanted to accomplish is, it's been really rewarding, but it's been, yeah, it has been super tough as well because obviously Kirby is a, a good friend of mine. You want to do what he does justice and you want to treat you know what he does with respect and he's you know that was a big challenge um because i wanted to make sure i was doing you know my best work and i was doing the right thing by other people but yeah so massive challenge in that and then just getting the book over the line was yeah it was, it's been tricky um it's definitely tested uh me personally and mentally but I'm, yeah, I I'm, couldn't be happier with the, the outcome. Your book release is happening this month over in, in is it in Margaret, Margaret River? Uh, here, it's in Bussenden. And so we're yeah. doing a full 
charity, uh, we're doing a charity event for Lifeline. And so the book's going to be released on the same night. So the crew at Shelter Brewing here in Bustleton, uh, they've so generously donated their upstairs space for us. Yeah, so the book's going to be released. We're going to raise some funds for Lifeline and just, yeah, have a couple of beers and celebrate. Moving on from here, and just the, um, I'm sure it's been a pretty roller coaster experience over the past couple of years. Is it, you know, what what's next? Is it is it something that you're going to revisit the idea of you know another big project, another book, or what's on the horizon for Ange Seamark over the next couple of years? You know, like it's kind of this whole process giving me uh, a fresh outlook on how to, you know, what's next. And I think that as for, a, I don't have a plan as for yet, but I just know that whatever comes next is going to be good. And I think learning through all this process and, and learning about myself is just going to put me in a good place for the next, next part when I, yeah, you know, figure out and get that direction on what I want to do and, and do it. So it's, so it's definitely lit the fire for you, which is, which is good to hear. So um, more to come. More guess, to come, so. yeah, absolutely more to come. <laughs> so it's just the beginning. I feel like I'm just kind of scratching the surface of my work and um, I really want to, yeah, just, I'm just looking forward to burying my head back into that camera. Uh, mate, uh, good to hear. Well, Ange, mate, thanks so much for your time. It's been a, a pleasure to chat and learn a little bit more about the, the project and, you know, the just your kind of experiences shooting in such an amazing part of the world. So really, really appreciate you jumping on and um, look forward to, you know, seeing the film one day and getting my hands on a physical copy of the book. Yeah, not long. And yeah, I just want to say thanks for the support always. The guys at Aquatech have always looked after me really, really well and um, appreciate everyone getting involved and having a look. And if you get a hands on a copy, thank you. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much, Ange, and I will talk to you soon. Cheers, mate.